All right, I think we'll go ahead and get started now. We've got enough people. I have a feeling we'll have people drifting in for a while. Thank you very much for all of those who came in today. Spent the time with Colleen and David and Bentley and Natalie and Shelby to celebrate the life of Steve Anderson. A very beloved uh, son, a father, brother, friend. Um, I'd also like to recognize all those who couldn't make it today but are watching via Zoom or social media. Um, and for those who do come up to speak, and we'll have a chance for many people to come up, please make sure you stay somewhat centered on the camera and speak into the mic so that they can hear as well in Zoom. Um, some of you are wondering who the heck this guy is that's standing in front. Not officially family, but Natalie and Shelby asked me and actually told me I had to introduce myself and explain my background with Steve so I could know what was going on. And since I sometimes always do what I'm told, maybe occasionally, um, I'm Stephen Tree. I first met Steve in 1988 when we were both in the same uh, mission in Zurich, Switzerland. Uh, we actually had the opportunity to go to the Little Matterhorn and go hiking up there. He wasn't my companion at the time, but he was in my district. So we met together in the morning. We went to a shop, a supermarket, got a bunch of food, and then proceeded to climb up the Little Matterhorn. And as the day went on, we saw that, noticed that Steve had paired up with Darren Stevens, another young missionary, another almost brand new missionary, and they taught us very, a very important lesson that day. Never let greenies shop unsupervised. And we learned that because we saw that Steve and Darren were getting more and more giddy and more and more goofy as the day went on. We're like, what's going on? It got to the point where it was just a little over the top. We kept going, you got to settle down. Like, yeah, 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 whatever. And then they would just go off and be really silly again. We finally figured it out when Steve pulled a box of cherry chocolates out of his bag and popped some more in. And in Switzerland, when you buy cherry chocolates in the supermarket, anyone can just walk in and buy them their liquor. So one of Steve's early experiences, and my first time meeting him, was for him to get a little bit blitzed as a missionary. So I have a picture I've been desperately searching for. I wanted it up here of him somewhat drunk, stuck in the back of a hatchback, looking out the windows. We put him in the car and said, all right, you just stay there while we get everybody gathered up to go home. A uh, very short time later, he became my companion. We served in Bali, Switzerland, um, in the middle of the Swiss Alps. We had an amazing time together. I'll talk a little bit more about the type of person he was in a little bit. But after we served together, we, I moved on to a different area, but then shortly thereafter, we were called to be part of an amazing group of 10 missionaries who were asked to go open up East Germany to missionary work. Many of those eight, well, those 10, are here today or watching via social media. Unfortunately, at the last minute, two didn't make it. Um, their visas didn't come in, and they had to join us later. But in March of 1989, Steve entered with the first group of eight missionaries into what was then East Germany. Um, he was my zone leader at the time, uh, which much to his frustration and chagrin. He went from being um, Steve 2, because he was my junior companion, so I was always Steve 1, he was Steve 2. He went to being my zone leader, Steve 2, still, still Steve 2, the zone leader. Uh, after our missions, then we got paired together, sorry, we got put in the same apartment in Dresden. We weren't um, companions, but we served at the same apartment in Dresden at the end of our missions. And I went home a short time later. He joined. Since then, our lives have been intertwined significantly. From me sitting in the hospital watching him recover after he decided that he was too tall for the girls he wanted to date, so he took a head dive off of a 100 foot cliff and compressed his spine and spent several days in the hospital. To him showing up at the airport when I flew back overseas, from overseas to meet my girlfriend and get what I thought was the worst thing I could get a Dear John letter. Steve knew I. Didn't need to get, just get that and be by myself. So he took that letter. He knew the um, young lady, and he took him at me at the airport. Fortunately, that letter turned out to be the best news I could have gotten because it freaked me up for what happened later. But Steve was there for that, too. I came back to the States right after having met my girlfriend, who's now my wife. And he had to put up with me calling back to talk to her every day. And um, he and Janelle were the first ones to say she loved me. She didn't quite get that on her. They did. Um, they talked to her on the phone at one point. I got tired of my incessant phone calls and then they immediately said, yeah, dude, she's totally in love with you. And I know she wouldn't even say that herself, but they were right, fortunately for me, and she's now my wife sitting here in the audience. 
I was with Steve as he sat in his car outside his home, desperate to stay close to his family. He was there as I had um, some heartbreak I could barely deal with. We talked to each other. We were there for each other. I've been to his children's baptisms, and I've been to Bentley's farewell and welcome home. And tried to be as much a part of each other's lives as we could. And that's why this is, quite frankly, one of the hardest things I've ever done. And those who know my background know that's not a low bar. But that being said, Adley, Shelby, Bentley, I didn't see where you disappeared to. Bentley, thank you. Although it's the hardest among the hardest things I've ever done, I'm honored and grateful that you asked me. So with that said, we're going to proceed as follows. Um, I hope I got this right. Mike is going to give the opening prayer, followed by a uh, um, talk from Bentley. His three children are going to talk first, Bentley and then Shelby, and then Natalie, and then I'll resume from there and I'll talk about the rest of the program. Is Mike anywhere close? Oh, here he comes. Our dear Father in heaven, a humble heart, morning we bow our heads. Thank you for this time that we can get together to celebrate. Our son, our father, and our brother and friend. Father, we thank you for this life. So much time to be short. We thank you for family. We thank you for praying. <clears throat> we ask you to bless us with the spirit this day. Bless his mom, his dad, bless him with peace. Bless his children. Bless him to know that Steve is loved by so many. If that can bring peace to them. Bless all those who have traveled to stay. Bless them with safety. Bless them with peace. Father, there are those who could not make it to stay. Bless them as well. We are so grateful for thy son, Jesus Christ. Grateful for his plan. So we don't always understand. Bless us to accept thy will. Bless us to share thy love. Thank you, Jesus Christ. All right. I'm a lot louder than Mike. Sorry. I, I got the loud the loud voice from my mom and, and from my dad. So, hey, happy Saturday. Uh, my dad and I, and I used to always say that while we were running so that we could uh, kind of shock runners and, and other people don't know. Because as we're always running, we always love to connect with people and share. And so it's always funny on the mountains. We just, or even early in the morning, we'd yell like, hey, happy Saturday. Hope you're having a great day. Some people would be shocked, and some people would stand back a bit, and some people would smile. Um, and so we hope you guys are all having a wonderful Saturday, and thanks for being here. Uh, this tale is really special to us. Um, I, one of these photos, if you, look at it, if you look in all of our photos, we have a photo of my dad building a jump, a snow jump, and jumping off of it with a snow kayak right above him. Back. So this is just a really special place. Um, so I'm going to be doing the live sketch today, and so I'll just start off here. So January 7th, 1969, my dad was born. 
um, something crazy to just kind of mark the beginning of his uh, of his of, of his him being on this earth was that the nurses on the third day came to uh, my grandma Anderson and told her that he had already rolled over and they couldn't believe it. And I think that just kind of marked the start of my dad's life, that he was always moving, he was always 100 miles an hour in every direction, and just something kind of special. Um, as, as a teenager, he worked for Mervyn Thompson, worked on a farm, and... Um, sorry. And he, he always spoke so highly of that, working on the farm and learning how to work hard. At age 15, he got his Eagle Scout. And as a, as a, as a gift for him, uh, getting his Eagle Scout, his dad bought him an RC airplane and kind of put it together for him. And my dad went out, went out to go fly it, and it flew for two seconds and ran into the ground and flew into peace. And that was the start of his flying career. Um, at at age uh, at age sixteen, he bought his own car. And for those of you who can remember, it was a beautiful yellow Pinto, one of the greatest cars of all time. And he loved that so dearly. And I think he even put lightning strikes on it at one moment. And um, he eventually, um, in high school, at his senior year. He started on the track team, kind of just kind of just joined randomly and ended up doing great. And that was the start of his running career. He was in high school. Um, he then ended up going on a mission, as Steve Trees talked about. And it was an amazing mission that inspired me to go on a mission later on. He had some amazing stories of smuggling books of Mormon and, and Bible things behind the iron, iron curtain. And it's always been a special time of his life, and um, so inspiring. We have several letters from general authorities, including um, the current Latter-day Saint prophet, uh, President Nelson, uh, actually personally mentions my dad in one of his letters. And in some of the other general authority books, um, they actually mention my dad and his work during that time. Um, when he came back from the mission, um, he, he worked at Bourne and he met my beautiful mom and they got married December 12th, 1990. They, um, the first year they lived here in Logan, um, kind of next, next to Logan Regional Hospital. And then, uh, my favorite story is that they bought a trailer out in Franklin, and uh, I was born in 93, and so my first year as a kid, I was trailer craft, so I'm kind of proud of that. Um, at this time, while he was, he was going to USU in engineering, and um, he was working at Icon uh, with his brother Brian, and, um, and starting into aviation at this time, too. Um, an important date that uh, several people wanted to make sure that I put on here is uh, in 1996, he bought his first boat. For you guys who haven't seen the picture, uh, I bet a third of them are just boating pictures. He loved the boat. He loved it. And all, everything was boating. He loved working on it. He loved driving it. He loved the kneeboard. He loved the wakeboard. He loved the water ski. He loved the slalom ski. He, he loved to surf. Everything about boating he loved. And so that was his first boat. Um, in 1997, he got his first internship with American Airlines. And he loved American Airlines. And about two years later, was able to uh, start working at American Eagle. Um, at that time, he graduated from Utah State. And um, also right around this time, in would have been in 98, uh, he met another amazing, beautiful woman, Janelle Meisner, and they got married November 20th of 1998. Um, because of the difficulty of kind of starting a pilot career, um, he, they moved to Puerto Rico, and they also moved to Texas, and they moved around quite a bit as he was trying to build his career. Um, 
And he was actually about to become captain. He's only been three years of becoming uh, of graduating. But then 9-11 happened and it kind of set him back. Um, so he wasn't able to get a captain bid with American Airlines that long. Um, but right around 9-11, right in 2000 2001, he had kind of stopped running for a while. And his mother, uh, Colleen Anderson, asked him to run the St. George Marathon. And in usual speed fashion, he said, I can do it without training. So he just showed up and ran the marathon and he paid dearly for it, uh, as he always did you know, with, his, with his crazy antics. But uh, that kind of started him back into running. And within a year or two, he was being sponsored by Brooks, a running company. So it just kind of showed his dedication that he could kind of sit and enjoy life and then just jump right back into running and it was amazing now. Um, One of the, the greatest moments of his life was um, him and Janelle deciding to build a house together up here. And in 2004, Janelle started designing it while he was flying. And um, at the beginning, the first week of March of 05, actually when Shelby was born. Oh, I'm sorry, Natalie. I completely missed you. I apologize. Oops. Sorry, you were kind of mixed in the notes with Puerto Rico here. Back up here. Natalie was born January 7th, which is also very important. She shared her birthday with my dad in 2002. Um, and that was, they were here in Providence, but then they had to go back and live in Puerto Rico. So Natalie got to uh, grow up in a, in a fun place too. Maybe not as fun as Franklin and Crater Park, but still pretty fun. Um, and anyway, going back to Shelby, sorry, Shelby. Hey, March 6th, 2005, Shelby was born. And they started working on the house that very same week. Um, it took them 18, 12 to 18 months, and they moved in in 06. And it was it was incredible. Um, it wasn't just a regular house either. My dad built that house out of specialized engineering foam and concrete. So it's earthquake, bomb proof, like it's incredible. And he built it with the help of a few family members and friends. And it was an insane project. And of course, I was, I think I was 12 at the time, so I was very crucial to the project. I was the official bluer and foam filler because I would walk around the house and fill in the cracks with foam. So I was very crucial to this project. Um, November 7th, 2005, he, uh, uh, he, was, he wanted to get some more jet hours. Unfortunately, with American Eagle, he was just getting, um, they were just flying smaller prop planes, and his dream had always been to fly a bigger jet. And so he started work with um, Frontier Airlines, November 7, 2005. And he loved Frontier so much. And he loved all the people there. And he spent a lot of time even working in the union and, and helping out so many other pilots. Frontier was one of his greatest loves. And um, it was a catapult for a lot of amazing things. Um, in 2009, this is kind of a, a funny, interesting Side note of him in 2009, as after going through some personal things, and he wanted to start traveling more, so he bought a motor. So I we became white trash again, and we started traveling around. Natalie and Shelby and I and my dad started traveling around, and going to all sorts of runs, and um, he he made it into a rental business so it could be on the side while he was flying, it could be rented out. But that was a big love of ours. And, he ended up buying a Jeep and renting that out and buying uh, a boat and renting that out. And we, we had a lot of good memories of having to fly out in the middle of nowhere to kind of rescue people that were stranded or that had broken something in the motorhome. Um, in the last few years, um, he's picked up uh, flight instructing again. And one of the greatest moments of our family was uh, him helping Natalie to get her pilot's license to do that. So now he's carrying on the birthright, and we're so proud of him. Um, I kind of have a, a side note here because as I was talking to everybody and pulling this list together, uh, it was mentioned that I should have a life sketch of all of his injuries. Because for those who know him, he was pretty crazy, and he was always getting himself in trouble. And I think his... Uh, his guardian angels worked full time, for sure, and so I'm sure they're glad that they have a rest now. Um, 
So I'm going to do a quick life sketch of some of his funny injuries. So just after his mission, he was riding a motorcycle. And uh, it's been a bit of a debate of who was working on the motorcycle before he was riding it. But the front wheel came off while he was driving it. And he ended up crashing pretty hard. And he kind of scalped himself. He also got, uh, <clears throat> he got rocks in his back that they had to scrub out. And that was always a good story because that was right after his mission. And then only a few months later, uh, when he was dating my mother, he decided he did a lot of cliff jumping and he jumped off Porcupine Reservoir off of a cliff, an 80 foot cliff. And he didn't dive correctly and he broke his back. And so uh, that was the, some of the beginning experiences with my mother dating him is him and his crazy antics. Um, he also got appendicitis and his appendix ruptured a year into the marriage of my mother. And in Texas with Janil, he was he was uh, he would go on these crazy runs in the backcountry and be bushwhacking. And one of the times he fell and he cut his he cut like almost a foot long gash in his shin. And he refused to go to the doctor. And so he super glued it for like a month and a half until it healed. He just kept super gluing. And that's just exactly him. So um, another time, he got a weird abscess right on his eye in Puerto Rico. But he was in Puerto Rico and he was kind of refusing to go to the doctors again. And it got so big that he couldn't open his eye. So he finally relented and went in and they had to drain it. Um, working on the house... There was so many injuries. I personally watched him fall like 20 feet and do a backflip as he was falling off of some construction supplies. And he landed perfectly. And there's just so many moments like that. But he nailed his hand multiple times. He was using nail guns and always nailing his hand. But one of the times it went straight through his finger. And, you know, rushed into the hospital. And in the ER, the, the doctor just pulled out a leather and just pulled out the nail. And he was so upset. He's like, I could have done that at home. Um, and I think, uh, Mike's and I favorite incident was he, we were water skiing with him and he was on, and he was water skiing slalom skiing with one ski and he crashed and the ski hit him in the head and he had this big gash in his head and, and as he was trying to get onto the boat and bleeding everywhere, we told him to wait and he didn't get a photo. So we have this photo and he still has this this uh, triangle-shaped scar on his head, so we call it a Harry Potter scar. So, um, this man scuba dived. He snorkeled. I was going to see if I could speak a little better without the microphone. Get a bit of a buzz. This man scuba dived. He snorkeled. He ran. He ran mountains. He rocked. Climbed, he mountain climbed, he flew planes, he fixed planes, he drove cars, he fixed cars, he water skied, he wakeboard, he surfed, he drove boats, he fixed boats, he built houses, he built hangars, he did landscaping, he ran heavy equipment, he painted, he did framing, he did concrete, he did so many things. And I think one of the I think the theme of his life was to do the impossible and to do everything, learning and sharing with others. And it was such an amazing experience to have him as a father and to learn so much from him and to get a little bit of his craziness in it. And um, I know that he's here with us and I know that he loved us. And uh, thanks, everybody, for being here. We had an amazing life, and let's share some more memories today. You never truly really realize how many people's lives you impact throughout yours. I 
never realized the extent of friends and loved ones my dad had until this week. It would take an army to ever come home for pain to my dad. That's what my family and I have here with us. I have felt such an immense love and support from everyone during this time. And I've been proud to see how many people's lives my dad touched. Anyone that met my dad knew he would instantly treat you like a friend. Whether it was drinking five attendants with fake roaches or fixing your tire on the side of the road. That's one of my favorite memories with him. Natalie, Bedley, my dad, and I were driving on I 15 when a car swerved across our lane. They can slam on our brakes and swerve out of the way. The car that cut us off was just trying to get to their exit before they missed it. They nearly made it, but hit free on the road and got a flat tire. My dad was laughing so hard along the way about how karma came back around, but he promptly took the next exit while still cracking jokes. Turned the car around and found the woman in her flat tire on the side of the road. Instead of telling her she almost hit us or giving her a lecture on paying attention to the road, he fixed her flat tire, offered to fill up her tank, and we left. To me, that story is just one of many life lessons my dad has taught me by example. He was always the best at giving advice and helping people out of tricky situations. He was the kind of person that would call you out for not acting right, but do so in a lighthearted and joking way. Like how he hit me like a cat whenever I said something snarky. He helped me through countless moments in my life and taught me how to be a good person. He taught me how to be brave and put myself out of my comfort zone. How to be generous and humble. How to face my problems head on but not slow on them. Most importantly, he taught me how to live as much as possible for one lifetime. It would probably take me days to recount the adventurous memories he gave me. Repelling off arches and lawns, swimming with manatees, surfing in Lake Powell, exploring street markets in Mexico, and so many more. My siblings and I visited so many places around the world, learned countless hobbies and skills, and tried so many new things with him. He was the kind of dad that lived to love his kids and to show them the world. I look back on the college trip he took us in 20 or 30 of our friends on, and I honestly can't grasp the amount of patience and determination that would have required. It just came naturally to him. It was never a burden to him to, to, to do these huge trips. They were the highlight of school summers. No matter how his health was, you could find him at Lake Powell at least once a year, cliff jumping, water skiing, playing king of the boat with friends, and riding dirt bikes on the sandstone. He always said his body grew. He always He always said his body grew, but his mind never did. He was a better dad and best friend than I could have asked for. Lived with enough memories for multiple lifetimes. I'm more proud to have shared 19 years of those memories with you. You guys here? Yes? Good. Okay, then we're good. Perfect. found joy in introducing my siblings and I to hobbies, encouraged us always to try new things. He put me through piano, guitar, and vocal lessons. <laughs> Sorry, we're having fun today. Hopefully this works now. No, not working. Wait, I don't think I could. 
<laughs> he put me through piano guitar and vocal lessons. As well as gymnastics, swimming, softball, soccer, and if they ever come to cross something on it. When I picked up the car with him, we can go to the bedroom. He was into a studio for me. Later on, when they started making jewelry, we converted the kitchen downstairs into a full school workshop. He played with the sandblaster, soldering tools, and the polish tools. Even though I think he might have been more excited to be first year for his cars, he wanted to be a He supported me through every phase of his artistic life, using his creative ability to build things to the best extent possible. I hope to one day have the opportunity to carry on that legacy. Everyone in my family has a little part of my dad that they carry with them. Whether it be for the lessons of Bluetooth, the product, pairing. his builds to rub off on us, to the influence his personality had on us. He would be honored to see all of you here in band t-shirts, flight uniforms, and board shorts in memory of him. I'll never be able to express the gratitude I have for how much he has loved and lives on through us. It's a proud honor to be his daughter and to see a bit of him in each and every one of you. I see my dad's love, humor, and strength the most of my sister Natalie. I cherish the opportunity I have to live up to my dad, my sibling. We carry a responsibility to continue his tradition for the example he set. To my dad. I wasn't ready to say goodbye to you. You were the most amazing dad to me. Thank you for the life you created for me and the memories you gave me. You supported me through every moment of my life, and I know you are now too. I'll try so hard to live life the way you did. My heart aches to know I have you here with me. I love you. My name is Natalie. I'm Steve's oldest daughter, and I'm going to try really hard to make it through this, but if I don't, Steve's going to have to take over for me. I've said it a million times before, and I'll say it at least once more. My dad was more than my dad. He was my best friend. He showed me how to ride a bike. He showed me how to draw and how to paint. He showed me how to surf, how to drive a boat, and how to tow a trailer. He showed me how to work on cars. He showed me how to build house projects. He showed me a love and a dedication to family that I aspire to show them one day. One of my greatest blessings was having him as my flight instructor. My favorite memory of my father is the day of my first solo. Many of you pilots may have had a similar experience in flight school. We were flying out of the Logan Airport, practicing landings and maneuvers like a typical lesson. After my third or fourth landing, my dad turned to me and said, all right, taxi back to the ramp, I'm hopping out. I whipped my head around in shock. I had no idea that today was the day that, was gonna, that I was going to experience flying a plane on my own. I responded, no, you're not. You're staying right here. After a long taxi, full of back and forth arguing, he calmly told me that I could do this. He told me that I was ready and that he believed in me. He assured me that I had been ready for a few flights now and that if I focused, I was going to do amazing. He watched from as close as he could get as I flew three patterns on my own. One of the greatest feelings I've ever experienced is hopping out of that impossibly sticky Cessna door and hearing his excitement, jumping into the biggest hug and hearing him tell me, I told you so. He, his faith in me was all I needed to believe in myself. I was terrified, but his faith in me gave me the strength I needed to push past the nerves. 
No matter how nervous I ever felt during a flight, knowing that he was there always brought me back to a feeling of security. No matter how many times he pulled the surprise simulated engine failure or made me go up on a windy day with a 15 knot crosswind, I've never felt more safe than I did sitting next to him in an airplane. A few weeks ago, he told me that besides his kids, flight instructing was one of his greatest joys in life. When I found that surprising, he said it was because he loved changing lives. He loved knowing that he had left that person with a skill and with lessons that they would never forget. He changed so many lives, I'm only now really realizing how many people he truly reached throughout his life. He left his mark on the world in countless ways through countless people. My dad was my biggest supporter and my biggest cheerleader. He tried so hard not to only be at every bit he could in my life, but also to be involved. When he missed sports games, piano recitals, shows, or events, he would sit and talk about them with me for hours after he got home. It never felt like he missed a thing. He had an en energy and an optimism that was easy to catch on to. He was always willing to lend a helping hand, no matter how much it inconvenienced himself. I can't count the times I grumbled annoyingly when he would yell up to my room asking me to join him in his latest project. He was always protecting his family. He would all, we'd always tease him about his need to sit facing the door in any restaurant or building in case of an intruder or emergency. He always tried to make me feel better when I was down or upset. And he always made sure I had flowers and a tree on Valentine's Day. I'll miss everything about you every day, Dad. I'll miss the adventures and the dreams. Me and Luna will miss you in the house and every walk or run. I'll miss the endless car projects filling up the garage and taking my parking space. And I'll miss the long conversations that filled our drives or long flights. I'll miss you so much. For you, we keep the adventures alive. For you, we keep the dreams alive. For you, we learn and we try new things. For you, we help people. For you, we travel and we chase excitement. And for you, we believe in ourselves and we tell ourselves that we can do anything. For you, we keep drinking Diet Mountain Dew so they don't notice the dip in sales. And for you, we keep flying. Blue skies, Dad, and I'll see you in the clouds. I'd rather go get blown up in a rock than keep going, I think. Easier. A lot easier. Um, thank you. Thank you, Shelby. Thank you, Natalie. Thank you, Bentley, for giving us insight into a man who quite literally helped change the world. If you look around, you see people in flight crew uniforms. You see people that were former missionaries with him. You see childhood friends and family who traveled from out of state. It's not a given. He changed individual lives on a regular basis, but he didn't just change individual lives. He literally helped change the world. I mentioned a little bit about him going into East Germany. I reached out to some members out there, and even now, 35 years later, people remembered him People spoke highly of him and wanted to be heard today. And I had several. I had to narrow it down to two because I don't want to drone on all day, but two particular ones that spoke up to talk about how much he changed them and in changing them changed the world. We've been told often that the spirit of Christ is the spirit of freedom. And as Steve Anderson went and taught the world, about our Savior Jesus Christ, people were excited. They'd never even heard anything about him except for possibly the name. We got asked in all honesty several times, we put cosmonauts in space and they didn't see heaven. Where is it? And that wasn't a sarcastic question. 
That was the extent of their knowledge, and he brought them that. And that spirit of freedom spread across the world. We got to be there as the wall came down, as people who had never experienced freedom got to experience freedom. And if you ask those people what brought it, what helped bring the change to their land, they'll tell you it was the spirit of freedom brought by the spirit of Christ. And Steve was a pioneer that did that so well. I'm just going to read quickly. You know, I never did get nervous before until after everything was over, and right now I'm shaking like a leaf. I guess it's appropriate given my name. Um, this is from one family in his first area, and I just picked one from each of his two areas in East Germany. Dear Bentley, dear Natalie, dear Shelby, and of course, dear family, when we heard of the unexpected death of your father, son, and brother, we were very surprised and saddened. We met Steve in 1989. He was a missionary in Leipzig in the then still existing German Democratic Republic, Germany, and had the privilege that he and his companion, Elder Kanyos, were allowed to stay with us at that time. Or had to stay with us. At that time, there were no apartments available for the missionaries, and they had to stay with members of the church. He was a very diligent and friendly missionary and followed the special strict rules of conduct that were imposed upon the missionaries. I'm sure Steve Tree and many in this audience actually can confirm this. But the members of the church were thrilled that the missionaries could finally work in East Germany. So we got to know him better and better during the months that they lived in our house. And when there was no more GDR and he had finished his missionary work and we could travel the world freely, we flew to Utah in the USA and also visited Stephen Logan, who had meanwhile discovered his love of airplanes and invited us on a sightseeing flight. And they go on to talk about their trip with him and how awesome it was to see that he stayed true to what he had taught them as a missionary. That was an example to them that he'd come back and he'd taken on a regular life and even then he was still elder anderson and at the end i said in any case the father in heaven felt he had to take him to himself we wish his children all the best for the future and especially natalie who we believe lived with her father and was with him when he died we send our regards to the entire family and once again offer our sincere condolences for the untimely passing their father, son, brother, and friend. With love, Regina and Ika Heinze. And then another member wrote, and she said, I can't put any better how he changed the world than in his own words. And so she sent me a picture of what he wrote to her as um, he left the mission field. He said, and I'm going to go a little slow on this, um, I didn't get a chance to run it through the translator, um, so I'm going to have to do it on the fly. But, dear Sister Piscon, it is a great joy to me to write to you my, my test to write my testimony to you in your book. You gave this word so much. It is always beautiful your smile to see your smile. I believe that you have a very special relationship with your heavenly Father. And I also feel deeply in my heart that your conversion and testimony came through prayer and conversation with Heavenly Father. Never forget that step. I am very thankful for the opportunity that I've had to teach you and the people of this land and to serve you. I know that I am a servant of Jesus Christ and that this is his church. God lives and Jesus Christ is his son. The Book of Mormon is the living word of God. The gospel is wonderful. Your brother, Elder Stephen Anderson. He told me she has read that and reread that to get strength over and over again. Gave her the strength after she left to come back. I could give lots of examples of how he's changed lives and changed the world. Now I'm going to turn the microphone over to those who would also like to talk about Steve and the change he's had in their lives, the impact he's had. Now, I know it's going to be therapeutic for some to stand here and go on and on and on about all the wonderful memories of Steve. But believe me, for those who are waiting also to share, it's not as therapeutic. So please... Share one or two short thoughts or memories, and then 
pass on the mic to the next that everyone who has who wants will have the opportunity and at the family's request should you fail to do so you'll find out that i am a high school teacher an alternative high school and i have no problem walking up and standing next to you if that's not enough of a hint i'll put my arm around you and if that's not a hint i will pry the microphone out of your hands and as tenderly and tactfully which unfortunately isn't very remind you it's time to pass the mic to someone else so we'll go ahead and turn the microphone first steve's mom and dad and give them an opportunity to share with them, share with us more of Steve. And as they're coming up, I just want to say, those of you who wish you knew Steve better, come talk to Natalie and Shelby and Bentley. You'll get to know him. They reflect him so well. They are truly his children. And through them, you will get to know him. Bluetooth pairing. Steve was full of it from the day he was born. When I was in the hospital, the nurse and then told me he'd turned completely over his incubator. He had a shock of blonde hair, kind of looked like a baby. His nicknames were Dynamite and tornado. All his life, Steve was perceptive and thoughtful of me. One time, <clears throat> one time I was on my hands and knees cleaning a nasty toilet. It happened to be my birthday, so I was feeling pretty sorry for myself. Uh, Steve, maybe four years old, walked into the bathroom and said, Mommy, you're the most beautiful toilet cleaner in the whole wide world. At that time, that's exactly how I felt, who I was. We have younger grandchildren. We have younger grandchildren. David, Allie, Penny, and Anderson. Their parents have a hard time explaining to them what had happened to their uncle Steve. After Kara talked to Penny, Penny said to her, but mommy, who will go for a boat ride with us? We all have that same feeling, Penny. Who will skim across the waves that like power. Restore a World War II jeep in the hangar. Conquer boulders in Moab. Climb a mountain peak. Fly to Idaho Falls for the 4th of July. Pan for gold. Fix a car. Buy someone's car and so much more. Steve, you have been a mighty meteor streaking across the skies of our life. Bentley, Natalie, Shelby, love you with a ferocity he applied to everything in his life. Honor him by loving each other. To my family, I have a found strength, peace, and even join your efforts to serve and support these family. Your love has the same and will sustain Dad and I in the coming days. From the beginning of time, Death has been love's greatest challenge. Love's greatest challenge. I believe now and ultimately. Love will conquer all. For this is my work and my glory to bring 
has the immortality and eternal life of man. Steve, you are mine. You are ours. I, we love you with a love that cannot end. We say this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Some of you have got to be awful hot. Please don't feel uh, embarrassed if you want to return to your car. I'm going to try to be real quick. Uh, you've heard the good side of Stephen. i got to tell you just a couple of little things. I'm talking about my family. Sit down. <laughs> when Stephen uh, went into the mission home, I was just a little worried. He's always so full of it. Just can't sit still. And he went jogging and he jumped across the car and scratched the paint being in the mission home. The mission president there sent him home. I said, You're not going on that mission, Stephen. And I I am not letting you go. And the state president used to talk to me. I said, I don't think you should go. And uh, you know, Stephen had the ability that I don't have, and that's to change his life and grow from this past experience. As a little kid, uh, Five years old, I had made toys. I made my Christmas toys, all of them, and I made him this beautiful scooter to sit on. Well, he had tormented one of the younger kids and hurt their toy. So, in front of him, I took that scooter in our backyard and I sawed the sucker in two with a handsaw. And uh, he learned from that. Uh, we worked together, we loved together, helped him build a home, helped him fix his old junker cars. Just recently, up there late, Dad, he said, this is going to be a legacy in my family. The only reason I want this property is seven acres up here is so that all my family can come and enjoy it. His wealth, he shared with everybody. He made wealth in the airlines a lot more than I ever did. He shared it. What a wonderful love that is, too. I'm going to end with one little thought, short poem describes him, made by Mr. Hunt uh, over 150 years ago. Abu Ben Adam, may his tribe increase, awoke one night in a deep dream of peace, saw within his room, like a lily in bloom, an angel writing in the book of gold. Extremely peace had made Ben Abu bold, and to the angel said, what writest thou? Angel raised his head with the sweetest accord ever and said, The names of those who love the Lord. Is mine one of them? Hey, not so, replied the visitor. A boost spoke more low, but cheered still, and then said, Then write me as one, I pray thee, as one that loves his fellow men. The angel wrote and left. Next night he came in a great exceeding light. Show the names of those whom the love of God has blessed. Lo, Ben, the Tim's name led all the rest. Thank you, Stephen, for exemplifying this in your life and the things you've learned and have taught me. And I would like to say this in the name of our Savior. Thank you, brother and sister Anderson. I would like to open up the family next. So, given everybody here considers themselves family, let's go with um, families by law, so blood and marriage. I'm getting this over with. <laughs> um, Steve is my big brother, and uh, all of you know how amazing he is. So I'm going along with my dad a little bit, although not with a poem. Um, Steve taught me to be resilient and strong <laughs> and where this came from. I can tell you so many stories of resiliency from my big brother, Steve. Um, but what I want to tell you, <laughs> and maybe there are some scars from it too, <laughs> was when he put me in a mummy sleeping bag <laughs> and he tied the top close. Well, first he farted in it, <laughs> and 
then he tied the top closed. <laughs> and then he told me there's only so much air in there. And <laughs> you're going to die. And as you die, your very last breath will be my fart. <laughs> so thank you for the strength and love. <laughs> I just need to uh, clarify one of the comments about that was not Steve's motorcycle that he read. <laughs> and uh, I don't know that the wheel fell off. Um, being Steve's brother was amazing. Um, every every activity was an adventure. But I'm grateful for the time that we've got. <laughs> Morning from the community and the family. Love you all. Well, after the fart story, I'm not crying anymore. <laughs> I think everyone here has a story. Um, Steve's not even a whole year older than me. We're the same age for a week. <laughs> we're the same age for a week sorry if you can't hear that so I grew up feeling and I still do that I grew up a little plant under a giant tree and that's how my life has been and you guys that know Steve know what I'm talking about he's a giant of a human being and he shared that with people in a way that made you feel someday you could be a big tree too <laughs> and we had so much fun. Just so, where's Steve Tree at? He has seven brothers and three sisters. It's going to be a minute. <laughs> <laughs> but growing up with Steve, we made little model airplanes. We always had goals to see if we could fly him longer than 10 seconds. I know if anyone's made model airplanes, that's not very good, but none of us even got to 10 seconds. <laughs> and somehow he flies good airplanes. We've always wondered how that's even possible. But as a little brother, and there's three of us, and we're all one year apart from each other. We just grew up in the same room. And it was a nonstop fight, argument, um, questions. We always argued over time travel, the weight of the universe, whether you could escape the black hole. And then every other girl seemed to think of, but I won't bring that up. And so I just, the last week I've thought many times about which one of our arguments he's realized is true. <laughs> <laughs> Since now he has those answers. Okay. We used to fight like crazy, especially mom and dad weren't looking. And there's three of us, so we had to pick a side. We always had to beat the two that were right and then fight against the other person. I remember him and I had a particular hard time for a little while. And we were in an all-out fist fight, and we had to stop for a minute. He said, wait, there's rules. You can't punch in the face, and you can't punch in the other parts. But we can punch each other as hard as we want everywhere else. And then David grabbed each one of us trying to stop us, and all I did was give the next person a free punch. And this went on for probably 15 minutes. <laughs> as long as you didn't punch each other in the face, so mom and dad would get mad at us. We grew up that way, and I much love Steve. Every fun thing I've ever done has been him by my side almost. And when we go on these trips, my wife would always say, make sure you got you know, a phone number to your nearest hospital because so one of you always comes home hurt. And that's, that's my goal in life. Steve, we miss you. We love you. And family, thank you so much. And as we showed you him, you were his. Right and good. I'm going to let someone else talk now. Yeah, well, you guys took away all my fart jokes. <laughs> uh, Chris still wanted to speak for a minute. I'm just kidding, Chris. <laughs> I, I got the builder out there. Uh, thanks, everyone, for coming out here. A uh, couple things I just wanted to ask. If Steve has worked on your car, would you raise your hand? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, raise your hand. 
accidentally just told me, you know, I didn't get to talk about the vehicles. And if if you know Steve, one of his great passions was motors and cars. And he is I just saw probably 30 hands raised there, and that's pretty amazing. Um the other thing I wanted to share was just the love he had for all of Natalie and Shelby's friends. I let's see some hands. Natalie, Shelby's friends, raise your hands high. <laughs> You guys are amazing. Steve lived to take you guys on adventures. And that's what we all have with him. I, I said it a hundred times, but that man has probably lived four lives. Nine. <laughs> <laughs> it says nine. But Steve, I love you. Uh, thanks for all the adventures you've taken me on. You never repay it. Love you all. I'm Steve's littlest sister, and um, wait, what? <laughs> the spoiled one. The spoiled one. Um, when I have been thinking about Steve this week, I just think if I were to take a mascot for the Anderson and what it means to be an Anderson, <laughs> Steve is like the perfect example. Um, he was just so fun full of life, he was at the family party, you knew it was going to be a good one, he, note to my other brothers, would always greet me and say, hello beautiful, hello gorgeous, <laughs> Nate always says, hello ugly, <laughs> um, I just grew up assuming that all men built their own houses and put new engines in their cars, <laughs> He just had this like spirit about him that if you want to learn how to do something, you figure it out. And I asked him one time, like, how did you learn how to pile your house with the electricity and build your cars? And he told me, YouTube. Like, and I, I just think we should carry that on, that spirit of our life is a time to grow and always if you want to do something, you want to be a runner, you want to be a builder, do it. Everyone has that capability, and I'm really grateful for his example of generosity and the way he gave back, and love him so much. Oh. Like Paula, I was tortured. Oh. <laughs> in fact, when Steve came home from his mission, I cried. I sat in the back of the bed and cried the whole way home, a whole hour. <laughs> but he's been such a support to my girl. on trips everywhere and let it be white trash RV for a week. <laughs> I love it. Thank you so much. <laughs> All right, Steve Free. You survived the brothers and sisters. Any of the missionaries from Germany that served with Steve, will you come join me for a minute? Greg, I saw you.
Friends, my name is Elder Muir. And with me is uh, Elder Karpovitz and, of course, Elder Tree. <clears throat> Elder Miles is joining us. Elder Matt Jensen. We represent those that uh, were with Elder Anderson when we opened up each journey. So, Kinyadale and Bentley and Shelby come here as his companions, his dearest friends during one of those great, great times. Want to share with you our love and our respect in a world of chaos and craziness and confusion and political divide and social unease. Steve Anderson represents all that is good and pure and holy of actually living life uh, to its fullest. I want you to know that that's not something he gained as a as a grown old man. He exudes that uh, through his whole life. We stand here humbled to be part of his life story and to have been touched by him and by all of you. Uh, to any of our dear friends in Germany, uh, especially President Schwester Al, Lieben Sie, Wünschen Sie alles Gute, Gesundheit, Liebe und Freude, bedanken Sie für alles. Unsere Freunde, danke. The German version of God be with you that we meet again. Both side this out Love you all. I hope you all can, all can hear me. Uh, we met Steve through the writing community, and uh, what a special guy he was. A picture over here of him pushing is our daughter, who was handicapped. And uh, pushed her in the desert, as we were talking to Bentley earlier. And uh, Steve knew where the photographer was, so he knew when to pose for that picture. And uh, after the race, I don't know if any of you have had Banbury Cross Donuts. Uh, if you did, you raise your hand. Not too many. Banbury Cross Donuts are awesome. And they make one called Cinnamon Crumb. After the race, we were talking to Steve near our car, and I had bought a dozen of those Banbury Cross Cinnamon Crumb Donuts. And... I asked Steve if he wanted one. After he, his first bite, he says, oh my gosh, he says, this is like cocaine. I could become addicted to these. He ended up eating four of them. Uh, what a great guy. We love Steve. And we're sorry. Oh. What a wonderful guy he was. Enjoyed every interaction with him and bless your family. All of you. Or Hi, for those of you that don't know me, um, I'm one of Natalie's best friends. Um, so if you're wondering what I'm wearing, I just saw I would wear something that he would probably wear to his own funeral. So a funny t-shirt and some men's swim shorts. Um, I was lucky enough to tag along in a lot of the Anderson adventures. Uh, 
if you see a little redhead in these pictures, it's probably me. Uh, it's a true honor to know somebody who is filled with life like he was. Uh, if it weren't for him, there would be a lot of things in my life that I would have never have done. Clearly, Steve made a huge impact on people, and he made so many people happy, especially me. He was like a second father, and I'm so grateful to get to know him the way that I did. He was a perfect example of living a life in the best way that I know, by having as much fun as possible and to not take it too seriously. Hopefully I can take what he taught me and learn to live my life to the fullest like he did. Um, I'm gonna miss him so much. Uh, and right now I would honestly do anything for him to just throw me off a boat one more time. Love you, Steve. I know your problem thinking, uh, who, who's this guy? Uh, I'm probably one of the results of uh, an earlier life. Of Steve's. Um, I had the privilege of getting to know Steve at a really close work environment. Um, Steve is uh, a wonderful teacher of many things. You, many of you can testify of that. Uh, but if you've ever seen the Discovery Channel or any nature channel, You've seen that, that little bird that's sitting there on the edge of the cliff. And the next thing you know, you see that bird, you know, being thrown off that cliff and it's fluttering all the way down. And you're just praying that that bird will spread its wings and fly. Well, Steve was that guy up in the nest that gave you that kick really hard and kicked you out over the nest and got you to fly. And I know exactly that's how Natalie felt when she was solo flying that day. Steve was a great influence to me in my younger life. He did teach me how to work with my hands. He taught me how to be self-reliant, to build something out of nothing and to, and to be able to uh, take care of things with a element of courage that Steve truly emulated. He was brave. He had no fear. I'll always greatly appreciate that. An example of him kicking me out of the nest was that when we worked together, he taught me mechanics, electrical, whatever the case may be, but made me really work for it. Every night when I would leave work at 12 o'clock midnight, we worked for the swing shift. I had to go out and figure out how to repair my own car because he would go out and sabotage it before I'd go and head home. And there'd be a, a line of cans tied on underneath my car and be rattling down the road and I'd have to stop and pull that out and probably fix something else on the way. We have had an ongoing fun rivalry of between friends, between truly, he treated me like a brother. And we always had a great, great time. I know you, your siblings were always teased and, and uh, I had a lot of fun with you. Let me give you one fast story and I'll, I'll be quiet. But uh, we, we'd always play tricks on each other, as you've heard. One of them would be on our cars. The other ones would be on our home or our apartment. I think uh, at one time I even toilet papered the inside of his home. And I know that didn't uh, keep Andre very happy with that one. Sorry. But I think his toilet head was filled with corn cobs by the time I was done and, and a few other things. But uh, Steve, I got to tell you this one, and uh, he really got me good. It was midnight. I probably just got done reattaching a throttle cable to my Jeep, made my way home in the middle of the winter, and across the street from every stoplight that I got to, people were honking at me. 
and flashing their high beams and honking and honking and flashing. What in the world? There's nobody out here on the road except a few cars. And I had no idea what that was all about. Anyhow, I pull into the driveway, walk into my apartment, and the next morning my wife gets up, looks out the front window, probably taking care of our son, and as she's looking out the front window, she's a, she calls to me and says, Shane, you won't believe this. I was like, what, what's going on? She goes, there's, there's a cardboard sign on the front of your car. I'm like, oh, okay. What is it? And then she goes, it says honk, I'm gay. I was like, what? I'm like, who the heck put that on there? Anyhow, you know, back in the day, it was pretty appropriate, but, uh, you know, I'll take my stripes right now. But Steve, I owe you one. And, uh, but because of your goodness to me and teaching, and teaching me to be brave and to take on life's challenges, I, I, I owe you one big. That's all I have to say. I know he was a true, true friend of Christ. That's the way he was to me. And I say that in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Hello, uh, my name is Travis Morgan. Uh, we thought we'd share a few stories from Steve's professional career. Uh, I got the opportunity to fly with Steve many times while I was at Frontier Airlines. Um, I remember the first time I met Steve, we got, I got to the Salt Lake Airport because I commuted to Vegas just like he did. I had no idea who this guy was, but I show up at the gate and he shows up at the gate and the gate agent tells us, you're not both going to make it. There's only one seat left. And Steve and I start talking. He goes, you're Travis? I said, yeah. He goes, I'm Steve. We're flying together tonight. We were doing the red eye to Orlando. So if we're not both going to make it to Vegas, how is this going to go down? Well, the rules are, I was there first. I get the seat. So he's like, you take the seat. I'll be there. Trust me. I'll be there. And I'm like, dude, this is the last flight to Vegas. Like, there's no way. It's not happening. He's like, I'll figure it out. So I said, okay, you don't make it. I need a test. Like, I need to know so that you know, we can make some other arrangements. Well, he made it 10 minutes before departure. He shows up. He had flown to Burbank and then from Burbank to Vegas. And now he's going to be the captain on a flight to Orlando. He made it. It was great. That was my first time flying with Steve. Um, and I flew with him many more times after that. But one time we landed in uh, San Diego in the evening. And we had only about 13 hours in San Diego. Uh, we were supposed to be at the van the next morning at 9.30. And uh, Steve said, hey, so tomorrow morning, I'm going to get up. I'm going to run to the beach. And I'm going to surf for an hour or two. And then I'm going to run back to the hotel. And I'll be to the van by 9.30. I'm like, this guy is crazy. There's no way. Like, a 13-hour overnight for me is, you know, sleep. And then breakfast and shower and go. Like, that's it. I don't have that much time. But he did it. He made it to the van. And he told me he had been surfing for about an hour and a half or two hours that morning. And then he's just ready to go. This man had so much energy and so much love for everything he enjoyed. I've never seen it anywhere else. When it came time for me to upgrade and to become a captain, they send you to, uh, they call it charm school. They try and teach you how to be a nice person. Um, and they told us to think about the captains we had flown with and who we wanted to try and be like. And the first person that came to mind was Steve. He was such a nice guy. We had so many amazing conversations and he really influenced me to become a better aviator and a better person. Uh, we often talked about religion and, uh, how much that was important to Steve and his connection to God. Um, and I really appreciate those conversations as well. And I just want you to know that we're going to miss him. Uh, he was quite an amazing guy and was loved by many. So many people have just been devastated this week in our professional world. And uh, we send our deepest love and condolences. I told his daughters today that I feel like I've known him for years because that's always what Steve talked about was his family. And uh, we send our, our love and condolences to you.
Uh, my name is Devin Fuzzy. I'm the Las Vegas Bay Chief Pilot and Steve's uh, Direct Chief Pilot for Frontier Airlines. And I, I do want to uh, echo what Travis said uh, about Steve. He's been an incredible person. Uh, I, I actually would rather be up here uh, more so in the capacity of a friend because uh, that's how uh, the relationship was with he and I. You always want to ask any pilot. You avoid your chief pilot. You don't talk to him. Either. <laughs> if you're talking to your chief pilot, something went wrong. So, uh, But that wasn't Steve. Uh, he would come by and say hi to me all the time, and uh, it was always great to talk to him. And I can't tell you how many people have reached out to me when they found out I was coming up here to extend not only the condolences uh, from the chief pilot office, but the entire pilot group at Frontier and many pilots everywhere to the family. Uh, he was an incredible person. Uh, it's, it's funny, we were joking about how the mannequin here with his uniform, it really should have a North Face jacket on it because he didn't, wasn't in uniform compliance. He usually wearing a jacket that he couldn't be. But I never gave a crap about that because I knew the person that he was and the kind of captain he was. When I see an emergency come across my desk, my phone, if I saw it was Steve's name, I knew it would be handled. Uh, and it was relieving from my perspective to be able to know that he was the one in charge there. Um, I could go on and tell similar stories to what Travis said. Uh, I, I do know Steve. Uh, I used to, you know, I, I'm from Utah originally, grew up in Pleasant Grove, and uh, meeting at Salt Lake for years. I knew Steve before I started at Frontier. He gave up the jump seat for me one time when I needed to go to work and I was new and I was scared to death uh, of missing the trip. But uh, that's the kind of guy he was. He would step up and help out. Um, but once again, uh, I, I'm so glad that we're here to celebrate the life of Steve. Um, he's the, I really do look up to Steve as the type of father that I want to be for my children. I see all the pictures of the Lake Powell trips and uh, that's exactly the kind of father that I want to be. So I'm grateful for his example. Thank you. My name is David Davidson, and uh, I want to thank the Anderson family for sharing Steve with us. I, I'm not sure how I became Steve's friend. We flew together. He was my first officer. Shortly after, I'm running rim to rim of the Grand Canyon. And Steve runs down the Grand Canyon up one side and then down the other side. By the time I got up to the other side, I was hoping I was going to live by the time I got to the top. And he said, Dave, he said, once you get up to the top, you got to turn around really fast and start going down or else you're not going to. Be, have enough courage to make it up the other side. I never made it up the other side, never did it, but I'm, I'm going to do it for, for memory of Steve. Steve and I text almost every day. I'd send him something or he'd send me something. Last time I communicated with him, he said, it's about my retirement party. And he said, I'm in the hospital. I'm sorry, I can't make it to your party. I may have to have surgery. And Steve would call me and say, hey, Dave, you need to buy, you need to be the stock. And then he'd say, hey, Friday is a terrible day to trade. He says, sell off early on Friday and then buy back again on Monday. And those tips and the tips made me uh, successful in a lot of ways financially. But he was that way. He would call and say, hey, I'm going to do this or do that. He called and said, hey, Dave, he said, he says, you know, I'd, uh, I'm pacing for this race. You should come pace for this race. I said, I can run, but I'm not a runner. Steve's a runner. I said, I'll, I'll do the pace, but I'm like an hour and 15 minutes behind him in the pace. And, and he would be there waiting at the end of the race and big smile on his face. Oh, you did great. And, and he ran pushing somebody while, while, while pacing. He was an amazing person. Uh, my family benefited from him. There's multiple, multiple experiences that, that I had. And, and I don't even know how I became his friend. It was just uh, an amazing. And and when we heard the news that he passed from Natalie, we were wishing it was a, a bad drink. It was like all of a sudden it was a, a big boy. But that big boy is good. It's good because Steve made such a positive influence on my family, on my son. Um, he signed him off for a couple of check rides or for a couple of events in his logbook. And my son said, wow, he is an amazing person. My wife would, or my Steve would say to me, my wife was there, he said, Steve, I don't know what you did to get such a wonderful wife. He was very complimentary, made you feel wonderful. We'll miss you, and I thank the Anderson family because uh, sharing Steve with us was a beautiful thing. And I received hundreds of calls, 
and uh, messages from the Frontier family, all speaking in very, very high regards of Steve and his uh, personality and the life that he chose to live. We'll miss you. Well, just when you think you couldn't love Steve Anderson anymore, you find out from his daughter, Natalie, that it's perfectly okay to wear shorts and a band t-shirt to his memorial service. What a rock star, right? I mean, that's the icing on the cake, but that was Steve. Um, my wife will attest to this. I was starting to think that maybe he was one of the three Nephites. And for those of you that don't know who that is, it was uh, three men from a long time ago that desired from the Lord to stay on the earth until his second coming. I've never met anybody in my life that knew how to do everything that Steve Anderson knew how to do. So in my mind, the only rational reasoning was he was one of the three. Apparently that wasn't so. Um, what an incredible man. I met him when he became my flight instructor at Utah State University. And not only was he just the best at what he did, teaching people how to fly, but he also became one of my best friends. Um, I feel it was a tender mercy. I hadn't seen Steve in eight or nine or 10 years. We would communicate via text or message here and there, but I had a son that had just returned home from a mission in December and he wanted to go to flight school. And so I messaged Steve, I said, hey, what are your thoughts like around Logan other than going to Utah State because he wanted to get through flight school a little faster. Steve's like, come on out, let's go fly my airplane. So thank goodness we did. We took him up on his offer, I think it was in February. Unfortunately, like Cache Valley in the winter time, it was uh, fogged in, but that didn't deter us. We met Steve out at his hangar. We got to see all the projects he works on, like was mentioned, restoring old war jeeps and just all these different things. What a one in a million guy. Um, it was funny. One of the other pilots was telling a story prior to us coming out. I think that was the last time I had seen Steve. Me and my crew, I fly for a different airline, but we, we cross paths here and there. We had just landed in Indianapolis. My crew were in uniform. We just got to the layover. We're walking in the hotel. And here comes the Frontier Airlines crew coming out. They're all buttoned up, ready to get on the band because as you know, the airlines want to run on time. Here comes a sweaty dude rounding the corner in his running clothes. And we look at each other, Steve, Jeff, and he tells his crew, as they're ready to get on the van to go to the airport to be on time, he's like, give me five minutes. I'm going to run upstairs and shower really quick. Hold the van. He's like, see you, Jeff. <laughs> Takes off. That was a typical Steve fashion. Um, so many memories. And I don't know if his daughters were there, but a few years ago at Lake Powell, we kept barely not seeing each other. We would be leaving when they would be showing up. I told him exactly which canyon we were in and which cove where the second houseboat in. And we missed each other. We had to pull anchor and get the houseboat back. But apparently he came driving down that canyon yelling, Jeff, Jeff. Other houseboat people are coming out onto their front end like, what in the world is this guy doing? I don't know if you guys were there for that. Um, he always wanted to, he was just living life. He's, he lived as though he were 150. He got all of his life experience in those years. Just one quick more experience. I was working on, I uh, can't remember if it was instrument or commercial. We had to do a long cross country. And he's like, hey, let's go to Las Vegas and let's take our wives. Like, like make a mini vacation out of this. I was like, all right, that sounds fun. So my wife and Janelle, so me and Steve are up front, they're in the back, had an awesome time. And uh, on our way back from Las Vegas, 
my wife thought it'd be funny to give me a wet willy while I'm flying. So she lifts my headset off, sticks her finger in my ear, and before I know it, is there anybody from the FAA in the audience right now? Raise your hand, I, I can pinpoint you. So before I even know it, so now I'm getting a wet willy, Steve, to get back at my wife, pushes the controls forward to where if you're not, you're hanging from your straps is what it's called. Everything that wasn't nailed down hit the ceiling. The wives are screaming in terror. I probably am too, because I wasn't ready for that either. He's like, don't you ever do that again. <laughs> um, so many great experiences. Coming in the land in Logan, it got fogged in. I was working on privates. We didn't have a lot of, uh, uh oh, he's saddling up. He's saddling up. We're fogged in. The top of the tower is sticking out. That's all you can see. And Steve's like, what? Like, obviously, we had plenty of gas. We could divert somewhere. Says, what would you do if we were running out of gas? And this was it. He's like, look, we know the runway is just to the right side of the tower. Let's go in and start descending. See what happens. Okay. <laughs> he, knows, he knows where all the buildings are. We did it. We went around. We diverted. But I'm glad that he taught me some actual lessons, not just book. He taught you real world, like what if. Steve, I know you're listening. I will always destroy you at racquetball. Till we meet again, brother. I love you. In the name of Jesus Christ. Yeah. Thanks for representing Generation X with your Nirvana shirt. I was listening to Nirvana yesterday and thinking of Stephen. Um, I have some unfinished business with Stephen. Uh, I'm John Crofts. I'm half Anderson. My mother, Estella, was, the, was David's big sister. And David and Colleen have the biggest family of all the cousins, and the most kids. And they also opened up their family to me. And there was always room for one more in their family. And if any of the Andersons ever need anything, I'm there for you. Um, and I, I wanted to talk a little bit about his uh, childhood. Stephen and I, our unfinished business, we were supposed to get together and have lunch, and I was going to get some money back from him because when I was a kid, I pulled weeds for 25 cents an hour, and I bought Stephen a squirt gun, and I said, don't you squirt Grandma Mildred with Anderson with that squirt gun. And he did. He scored her with it, and she took it and smashed it right in front of us. And then she said, you get over here too, John. And she grabbed my hair and smashed my squirt gun. So and Stephen was laughing. He thought that was the funniest thing, that I got my hair pulled, and he and my squirt gun smashed. But he was such a great guy. And it was a hot day, about like it is today. And I just have so many good memories of the Andersons. I think that uh, uh, Steve had one of the best blessings on the planet. He has some of the best parents in the world. David and Colleen, I love you so much. And I don't think anybody should, I don't think any parent should ever have to watch their child pass. And uh, anyway, I, you're all gonna go to heaven. I, and I, I think that the atonement's so broad, it's gonna, I, I think a lot of you guys are gonna be surprised to see me and other people there too. But. I can't wait to uh, talk to Stephen and finish that unfinished business, and I want my 50 cents back from him. It took me two hours of pulling weeds for, I think it was Uncle Van. I think he paid us a quarter an hour. Squirt guns didn't work with Grandma Mildred. And, uh, Steve, just, he did things like that all the time. He's just the funnest cousin. And I, I'm just three months older, or older than him, and I felt like... Uh, I kind of got chipped out of his death too. And I really did want to meet up with them. And I just want to say, you know, a really good attribute you have is when you're suffering and you hide it and you give happiness to other people. I know he had a rough life on, at times and no one knew it. He just hit it, he gulped it down. And, you know, to his kids, you know, you're, you have one of the best parents in the world too. I don't know your other parents, but Stephen is a real, compliment to everybody and uh i love him and i'm gonna miss him and i do want my squirt gun back and it's too bad they don't sell those 50 cent squirt guns anymore i would have put one with them thanks
Um, I'm Steve's neighbor, and I'm going to speak for all of his neighbors. How much? Oh, right here? Okay. All right. Um, I'm going to just speak for all of his Steve's neighbors. There was never a, a day when Steve was actually home. There was never a dull day that went by when he was there. Um, he would, he wouldn't sleep, he wouldn't rest, wouldn't take a nap. One day he got up early, probably six in the morning to go mow his lawn. And when I saw him, I said, Steve, who mows their lawn at six in the morning and wakes everybody up? Don't you ever do that again? So um, I tell him all the time whenever I saw him, he was just going with the boat, with his, <clears throat> all of, you know, he had all these um, things to do, all the stuff put, um, in the back of his truck. And I'd always yell over and I'd say, Steve, go take a nap. Or Steve, go watch TV, grab your potato chips, sit on the couch to see what it's like. You've never done that before. And I think when I said that to him, he just cringed. Like, never a day in my life would I take a nap or watch TV. But anyway, I just want to tell you how how great of a neighbor he was and how good he was to my kids. He, I think he, unless my, my daughter's the little redhead, little mermaid, he taught her so many things to climb, uh, to rock climb, to ski, to anything she can do right now. I think he was the one who took her everywhere and taught her everything um when he would go to lake cal with my kids and i was always worried about how you know little 22 year olds how they would act kind of scary and every time steve would go with them and i'd say oh good maybe someone could stop them from, you know, causing trouble, getting in trouble. Then I thought, wait a minute, Steve would be the ringleader in doing that. So one thing he he did was he, while he was in like Cal, he texted me and my husband and he said, I have never been with a greater group of kids. And I was so happy to hear that from him. And he said that these young boys were the some of the funnest times he's ever had. And he talked so highly about all of them. I know how much they all really loved him and we're going to miss him minus the mowing the lawn at six in the morning, but we're going to really miss him. We're going to help take care of Nat and Shelby and whatever you guys need. We're, we're here for you. Um, I was so honored when we were at the house and Nat's, Nat's mom, Janelle, was talking to the social worker. She said, well, I'm Nat's mom. And she introduced me as Nat's second mom. So really honored for her to say that. OK, before I get falling my eyes out, I'll just say we love you, Steve. We'll miss you. And hopefully we can live to honor you and make you happy when you look down on us. Another thing, just want to add that my son up in heaven is going to love him. They're going to have a lot of fun, and he's going to teach him to fly and teach him things. They're going to have a good time. Thank you.
one more thing, sorry. My husband wanted me to say that if anything ever happened to him, that I was to marry Steve and I'd have the time of my life. We've got time for one more person. While he's coming up, a couple of housekeeping items. When this is over, please stay in your seats if possible for a few minutes. We're going to do a draft drone flyby. And um, we want everybody waving when the drone goes over or just sitting? Waving? Waving? Okay. Um, for those who didn't get a chance to come up and speak, please take advantage of the registry here or the online registry at White Pines. And that might also White Pines staff. Thank you very much for all you've done to pull this together. Um, and then there will be a... Um, Voting activity, bring your favorite Steve food and come to Newton Dam at four o'clock today. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Craig Robbins. By show of hands, how many pilots do we have out here today? There's a lot of us. Uh, I met Steve when I became a flight instructor at Utah State. And I'm going to take a different tact. Uh, Steve was a pain in my ass. <laughs> from the day I met him, uh, to go along with his poor sister, on one of our first excursions, Jack Hunter had asked us to fly down to Salt Lake City in the Arrow because as 141 instructors, we needed to go fly with the FAA, with Tom Dufresne, and uh, that was a lot of fun. And on the way down there, I learned that apparently Steve had been on a steady diet of cabbage the night before. Now. If you've ever flown in a Piper Arrow, there's no, there's not a window in that airplane. There, there's a door that you can open, which was on my side. When, when it got to stinking something terrible, and, so, and Steve just laughed. He looked at me and just, he's like, just enjoy it. And, and the only windows on his side, I'm like, please, please. no, 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 man, just, just, just let it marinate. Oh, it was brutal. And I thought, you and I are going to get along just fine. Uh, fast forward a little bit, February 98. Jack brings in a new student. He says, Craig, this is Janiel. Uh, you're going to be her flight instructor. I was like, oh, great. And she, Janiel was gung-ho. She was one of those students that every CFI hoped to get. She wanted to fly like crazy. So we got her up, trained her up, sold her. I don't think I got much further past that. And then fate intervened. I sent Janelle on a stage check with Steve. And, uh, and then I never saw her again. Uh, thanks, thanks for that, Steve, taking one of my favorite students. Um, for those of you who follow Steve on Facebook, uh, you may have seen where politically he and I, we differed a little bit. Uh, and I thought, this is the stupidest smart person I've ever met when I was having these arguments with him on Facebook all the time. Uh, I'll wrap it up quick. About two months ago, I'm on a layover in Denver and we're headed over to pick up the crew. And after hearing these stories of Steve running down at the last minute, it makes sense because we're parked in front. So the van left with us and then there was a second stop along the way to pick up another crew. And I was probably head down, not paying too much attention when the door opens and we're, I'm thinking, well, we're a little late now. And in comes, here's Steve Anderson. And I thought, oh, of course, of course. Perfect, perfect. Um, I didn't fully appreciate it at the time. That was going to be the last time I saw him. And I'm so glad I had that opportunity. And I have a picture. Uh, Steve? We miss your brother, blue skies and uh, sorry, blue skies and tailwind. Until we meet again. To uh, steal a line from the great philosopher Mel Brooks, it's good to be king. With the microphone in my hand, I'm the king. That's right, with you, honey. Yeah, thumbs up on that. My wife says I can be king for a second. I'd like to end with two thoughts before I turn the prayer over. Turn it on my phone over for prayer. One, we're all sitting here thinking the world's going to be a little less bright, a little emptier without Steve. It doesn't need to be. Steve has shown us what we can do to bring the light and fill the void. And my request, my plea to you is do not let the world be a little bit darker. Do not let it be a little less full, a little less exciting. 
when you have an opportunity to reach out and help someone, when you have a chance to brighten somebody's day, I want to hear. I want you to hear in your mind a big heck yeah. And I hope you guys know what I'm talking about. Big heck yeah, because that's what his attitude was. Heck yeah, we'll do that. And I want you to reach out and I want you to brighten somebody's day. We don't need to have a void after Steve left. We can fill it. It'll take a lot of work and it'll take all of us, but we can do it. For the second point I want to make, I need to give a little bit of background. And Atlee, Shelby, Bentley, this is for you. I want you to pay attention to what this means to you. In the military, when somebody leaves us, whether through death or retirement or separation, we have a ceremony and we honor them for their service and the work that they've done, just as we've honored Steve today. And then we tell them to stand down. We have the watch. We'll pick up where you left off. And I have said that to many people, but never. It's heartfelt as much as I mean it now. Natalie, Shelby, Bentley, in those days that come, and you want to say, I want my dad. I need to talk to dad. Where's dad? On behalf of your uncles, his literal blood brothers, and those of us who consider him brother, I want you to hear this. Steve? Stand down. We have the watch. Come. Our dear Heavenly Father, and before you, read this beautiful name, this beautiful name, the origin of the Steve Father. Thank you for the time that we were able to spend with him. He was a special person, and now he is with him. Special people that have gone before him. Please bless his family. That they will constantly feel of his love. Please bless the rest of the days that day. We will go and say to you that you will be with us. Bless the family and show me a And know that we are there for them. We'll be there for them always. Say the same to the name of Jesus Christ. All right, we'll have a drone fly by here in a second in honor of Steve. Wave, and then again at 4 p.m., please, please, to the family, write down your memories in the book or online at White Pines. We would love to have those preserved forever. Thank you all for coming. God bless. Have a wonderful day.